yep. or, or China, and the jury is still out on that. You know, initially when this story broke, almost two uh, last year, the first uh, incident was uh, reported almost two years ago, and uh, initially U.S. officials, once they sort of put together that that uh, diplomats uh, in the beginning falling sick here in Cuba, um, that they felt a sonic weapon could have been used, something that used high uh, pitched sound right. waves. Uh, now they've discounted that, saying it doesn't, that doesn't work, and they believe it's these microwave weapons because that fits uh, with the injuries that were described, essentially concussions and other head injuries where there was no physical trauma. Uh, so that is uh, one U.S. theory, the leading theory. I've just come from an interview with a Cuban investigator, and they say that doesn't uh, fit uh, with their uh, investigation. They don't feel that a microwave weapon could be used at such great distance with such great precision. So here we are almost two years after the first instance uh, began, and we're still arguing over the science of whether or not these attacks are even possible. And so is it, did they, obviously, you, it sounds like the, your Cuban interview disagrees, but from what, what's being reported, that the, the microwaves, is that what is believed to have happened both in Cuba and in China? They just don't know because there's no physical evidence here on the ground that supports this. Uh, the FBI has come to Cuba many times, has gone through the diplomats' homes. Of course, these diplomats are back in the United States, as you said, uh, getting care and attention. So uh, the scientists that have been consulted by the U.S. government, this is what they've come up with. This is, they say, the hardware that makes this kind of attack possible, but they've yet to see any hard evidence on the ground that really supports this. So it is a leading theory, Brooke, but it is still just a theory. Got it. Patrick Ottman. Thank you. In Cuba, let's continue on. Top of the hour, you're watching CNN. I'm Brooke Baldwin. Thanks for being with me on uh, what is hopefully a quiet Labor Day Monday for you. Uh, we do have some breaking news for you that the president has just sent out a stunning uh, tweet, a slam uh, of the uh, Justice Department and the man who leads it for doing uh, his job, charging people suspected of a crime. Uh, the people, uh, two uh, Republican congressmen. So let me just first read you uh, these two tweets from Trump. Quote, two long-running Obama-era investigations of two very popular Republican congressmen were brought to a well-publicized charge just ahead of the midterms by the Jeff Sessions Justice Department. Two easy wins now in doubt because there was not enough time. Good job, Jeff, dot, dot, dot. Uh, the Democrats, none of whom voted for Jeff Sessions, must love him now. The president is referring to New York Congressman Chris Collins and California Congressman Duncan Hunter. So let's uh, have a conversation about this, shall we? I have with me CNN senior White House correspondent Jeff Zeleny and CNN senior political analyst Mark Preston. And um, let's back up two steps first, Jeff, to you uh, on the context of uh, the charges these two uh, Republican congressmen face. Remind us. Well, Brooke, uh, Chris Collins, the uh, New York Republican, who was an early and, and loyal supporter of this president, was charged uh, a month or so ago on, um, on a variety of insider uh, trading charges about a, a pharmaceutical company in Australia, if I recall. And this insider trading, very serious. Uh, he is uh, and was indicted on those charges. Uh, the Justice Department, of course, oversaw that indictment, but uh, there, uh, you know, is no reason to believe that uh, politics played any role in that. And uh, Duncan Hunter uh, was uh, more recently uh, charged, he and his wife, uh, for a variety of things, uh, wire fraud, other matters, campaign finance violation. The allegation is that they misused, in fact, stole nearly a quarter of a million dollars in campaign funds and saying it was being used for a variety of things where, in fact, they were going on vacation and using it for personal matters. So these two very serious charges, not uncommon, uh, for the Justice Department to file charges against sitting members of Congress. We've seen it from both parties over the years. What is extraordinarily uncommon, I can't recall this ever happening, the president weighing in specifically on a specific case and also suggesting that politics should have played a role in this, that the Justice Department, which of course is overseen by uh, Jeff Sessions, who's uh, a Republican, appointed by this Republican president, he's saying that they should have given them special treatment and not charged them during an election year. So, Brooke, that is what is the unusual nature here. The president uh, has long taken many swipes at his Attorney General Jeff Sessions, but not for anything like this. He's saying, look, he should not have charged them simply because they're Republicans. Mark? How do you explain that? This is extraordinary. Uh, I think it's really unfair that you're asking me to try to explain Donald Trump. I mean, this is I mean, he's, he's, implying, he's implying that the Jeff Sessions Department of Justice 
you know, right. should hold off on prosecuting to it's, save these seats. It, it, it's absolutely, I mean, gosh, I've said this before. I'll say it again. I'm sure I'll say it again in a, in a few hours, if not a few days. It's absolutely insane, the behavior yeah. we're seeing come out uh, of President Trump. If you look at that tweet, okay, uh, the successive tweets that he sent out, he's using that tweet, A, as Jeff uh, points out, uh, for political purposes. He's, he's putting it out and he's making a political argument not yep. to press charges against two individuals who are facing very serious charges. And by the way, any of you who are, who are driving in, in your cars listening uh, on Sirius or watching this at home, if you were charged with these crimes, they wouldn't wait until after November to charge you with those crimes. So that's one. The second thing is, is that he's using these two congressmen as, as a bludgeon. He's using this these tweets to, to, to beat down Jeff Sessions. He's not saying that these folks aren't guilty or, or they're innocent or offering support to them. All he's saying is that they are very popular and there's not enough time to try to save these seats. That's astounding. You know what this kind of reminds me of? We were, Jeff, to you, remember my days, weeks are running together, but, you know, during the Paul Manafort's you know, first his trial in D.C., and I remember I can still see the president, you know, walking out of the White House and making comments while, you know, this jury is about to decide, uh, right. you know, this former campaign official's fate. And the president interjects into this federal trial and essentially is like, he's a good guy and it's really sad what they've done to him. That was Paul Manafort. This, in, in a similar way, he is injecting himself as the president of the United States, uh, talking politics uh, with regard to these two men. Exactly. I mean, the uh, overflying force here, as Mark just said, trying to use these two uh, Republican members of Congress as another uh, weapon or hammer in his ongoing feud with Jeff Sessions. Now, we heard uh, the president say last week in that interview with Bloomberg News that uh, Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, will stay in his job at least until November. After that, he couldn't be sure. Now, who knows? I wonder if this will change that. But it's, it's very curious as to why the president is weighing in on this right now. Uh, the charges hmm. happened uh, last month. Uh, this is not anything new. There's not anything new information, as far as I know, with Duncan Hunter or Chris Collins. But the president clearly still hmm. trying to build this case that the Justice Department is against him. The Justice Department is against Republicans. That is what he's trying to do. But uh, everyone knows that there are career prosecutors and Republican appointees uh, overseeing this in the Justice Department. So as of now, Jeff Sessions has always fought back. He has said in a statement just last month that he's not going to allow political considerations to get in on his, uh, on his actions there. Uh, this is, though, pretty extraordinary because the U.S. attorneys in uh, New York and California that oversaw both of these were Trump appointees. So that yeah. is what is extraordinary here. The president, he said last week at a rally in Indiana, he'll get involved. Perhaps this is what he meant now going after specific uh, these allegations here. It's a great point, though. Why now? Ponder right. that, and maybe that will become evident in the coming hours. Jeff and Mark, thank you guys both for jumping in on that with me. Um, moving on, Democrats, they're sharpening their strategy. One day ahead uh, of a major face-off on Capitol Hill, tomorrow begins the process to what could turn out to be Trump's most enduring legacy, the makeup of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, confirmation hearings begin for Judge Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, he would become the fifth conservative voice on the highest court of the land, giving the right-leaning justices the default majority. So let's go right to CNN and senior congressional correspondent Mana Raju, who has all this great new reporting on how Democrats really plan to, uh, to take on, you know, Brett Kavanaugh, Judge Kavanaugh. So, so tell me about what they're really going to be honing, honing in on. Well, there's a sharp line of questioning is expected on Wednesday. Four main areas, Brooke, that Democrats in particular want to push on and will be very contentious line of questioning. One is about his truthfulness. They believe he was not truthful to the committee over some key issues. When he testified before the same Senate Judiciary Committee in 2004 and 2006, involving surveillance issues during his time as a Bush aide, uh, as well as detainee policy, as well as his role with three judges who are not nominated by then-President George W. Bush. In addition to that, uh, expect some significant questions about the Affordable Care Act uh, and uh, the Texas-led case aimed at overturning that law. Democrats want to hear whether or not he would support or believe in the constitutionality of the protections for people who have pre-existing conditions. Uh, and, of course, a significant line of questioning is expected to be focused on Roe versus Wade. He has privately told senators that he believes that it's settled law, the, the landmark Supreme Court decision, but that does not necessarily mean he would not overturn that precedent if given the opportunity, at least in the eyes of Democrats. So expect a lot of questions about what 
federal law means, means, and finally, his view about executive power, specifically how a president can be investigated by an outside entity. He has previously expressed some skepticism about independent counsel and as well as about indicting a sitting president. How does he view the Mueller investigation? And the view is, if he's not forthcoming in his answers, perhaps that could convince some moderate Republican senators to flip and their own red state Democrats to vote against him. But still, very difficult chances right now for the Democrats to block his confirmation, bro. We'll look for those four themes uh, during the grilling on Wednesday. Manu, thank you. Uh, let's talk more about Judge Kavanaugh. With me now, CNN Supreme Court reporter Ariane DeVogue and Paul Collins, a legal studies professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, who co-wrote the book Supreme Court Confirmation Hearings and Constitutional Change. So um, let, let's begin with, you know, Manu just went over the, the Democratic attack, right? So Ariane, how do you expect Judge Kavanaugh to handle those issues uh, and avoid pitfalls uh, in the coming days? Well, what's really interesting is the whole abortion debate here, right? Because uh, he could very well be the fifth vote to overturn Roe or really cripple it, weaken it. Uh, he's never said how he's going to vote on Roe v. Wade. His court actually did have a case uh, where the court ruled in favor of an undocumented teen who sought an abortion, and he dissented. He's also said uh, in the past that Antonin Scalia and uh, uh, former Chief Justice Rehnquist were role models. So nobody really knows how he's going to vote. But what the Democrats are going to seize on is the fact that Susan Collins, she's a Republican, she believes in um, uh, abortion rights. She came out of her meeting with him and said, look, hey, uh, he said Roe v. Wade is settled law. But that doesn't mean anything because every lower court judge, right, has to do what the Supreme Court says. But once you become a justice, uh, you don't have to. You could vote to unsettle it. And that's what the Democrats are worried about. And that's one of the key lines of attack we're going to see uh, during these uh, hearings, Brooke. I think that's key. Let me just reiterate on Roe v. Wade, despite what, you know, Susan Collins feels, right, the fact that that really may not be settled law. So stay tuned for certainly questions on that. Uh, yeah. Professor, to you on, let's go back to something that uh, Brett Kavanaugh, he had written, uh, this is uh, from a couple of years ago, this is a 2009 Minnesota Law Review, hearkening back to the, uh, the Ken Starr, President Clinton era. So looking back to the late 90s, for example, the nation certainly would have been better off if President Clinton could have focused on Osama bin Laden without being distracted by the Paula Jones sexual harassment case and its criminal investigation offshoot. Uh, to be sure, one can correctly say that President Clinton brought that ordeal on himself by his answers during his deposition in the Jones case, if nothing else. Can you just give me a little bit more context around, you know, when he was writing that, um, and and do you think, just relating it to from independent counsel then to special counsel and Robert Mueller now, should Judge Kavanaugh recuse himself from anything Mueller-related? I think he should recuse himself. Um, this is going to be a major part of what they're discussing on Wednesday and Thursday, right? So Ariane is exactly right. Abortion is going to be a major, major topic of a conversation. But they're also going to be talking a lot about his view of presidential privilege. And the Mueller investigation is absolutely going to be in the backdrop of the entire confirmation hearing. Ariane, what do you think? Well, I think that uh, it is, and I think another big question, and Manu talked about this a little bit, is uh, the, the role of the documents, right? Because this is an unprecedented time. No other Supreme Court nominee has had thousands, hundreds of thousands of documents. He's a product of the, the Internet age and the mm -hmm. email age. And Grassley says, look, um, I'm giving you so many documents, and on top of that, I'm showing you that it, you're going to be able to go through 300 of his judicial opinions, like uh, Elena K had never had anything like that. But Democrats on the other side, they have these three points of attack. First of all, they say, uh, yeah, you're not giving us any documents from when he was a staff secretary. Uh, some of the documents are being held uh, committee confidential, and that means only members uh, can see them. And the people who designated that were Republican lawyers for Trump and Bush. And finally, they point out that the White House is saying that they think that about 100,000 documents should be withheld for constitutional privilege. So right. there are a lot of fireworks that are going to come up in the next few days. I've got one more for you guys, Paul. This is for you. And obviously, 
hard to predict the future on who becomes the, the swing vote on the, the nation's highest court. You look at, you know, the late Justice Kennedy, President Reagan appointed him, uh, he voted for Citizens United, he was for gun rights. But when you look at, uh, you know, the swing vote and what many liberals consider big court wins, same-sex marriage, banning the death penalty for juveniles, uh, reaffirming Roe v. Wade in 92, you know, I, I've been reading this morning for the first time that in 80 years, the swing vote could become the chief justice now, John Roberts. So would you agree with that, A, and what does that say about just the ideological shifting of this court? Absolutely. So all the, all the evidence suggests that j the chief would become the swing vote, and that is a very unusual thing to happen. Um, over the course of his time on the court, the chief has moved over a little bit to the left. He's still to the right of, of where Justice Kennedy occupied his space. But there's no doubt that if Judge Kavanaugh gets confirmed, Roberts will find himself on that, in that seat. But what's interesting is I highly doubt you're going to see Judge Roberts uh, act in a way that Justice Kennedy did in the sense that John Roberts is more conservative than Anthony mm -hmm. Kennedy was. Mm -hmm. Paul Collins, Ariane DeVogue, I know we'll all be glued to these uh, hearings over the course of the next few days. Thank you so much.